So today, we're going to talk about how's your love life. <laughs> now, our world has a lot to say about love, um, but when I want real truth, I go to the Bible. A lot of times, though, I'm still a little bit confused, and so uh, when I need some help with interpretation, I find that kids often age about four to eight uh, provide keen insight. And so what I want to do is start off this morning with um, asking the question, what does love mean? And here are some responses that, that young children have uh, given. Let's see if we can. Uh, but I'm working on it now. There we go. It helps to turn it on. All right, so first one, love is when you go out, uh, when you go out to eat and give somebody most of your hot chips uh, without making them give you any of theirs. Or love is what makes you smile when you're tired. Here's another one. Love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure it tastes okay. <laughs> love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents for a moment and listen. Uh, love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt, then he wears it every day. <laughs> Hint, guys, you should change it every so often. <laughs> Love is when my mommy gives my daddy the best piece of chicken. And that is true love, I think. Uh, love is when your puppy licks your face even after you've left him alone all day. Or when you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down and little stars come out of you. <laughs> and the last one's uh, you really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot because people forget. And the last one, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. I can affirm that. So... With, with some of those insights that we've gained already, let's pray. And then um, what I'd like to do is have us look at John um, chapter 4, uh, 1 John chapter 4, sorry. Let's pray. Father God, we, we come before you as broken people. Father, we know that, that there's so much that uh, we go in a different direction of what you're going. But yet, Father, we know that you, um, you desire for us to, to be able to walk with you closely and to follow you. We know that you want us to love each other and love you well. And Father God, I pray that, that as we explore this whole idea of our love life this morning, pray that you would help us to really apply some of the things to our lives. And, and, and Father, that you would help us to love you more and love others more. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Now, when I say the word Jesus or the name Jesus, what thoughts, what feelings, what emotions come to mind? Are there some different pictures that happen in your head when I, when I say the name of Jesus, what is it that you imagine? For some, there might be an element of worship. For others, there might be church. For some, it might be strict discipline of, you know, sort of that Santa Claus figure that knows everything you do, but is sitting there judging. For others, it's forgiveness. Some see a great teacher a role model? For some, it's a revolutionary. Some, it might leave a bad taste in your mouth. 
And that's okay too. We're glad you're here. For the author of our book today, I think Jesus' name evoked one strong emotion. You see, he deeply connected the name of Jesus to love. In fact, the Apostle John, who wrote this book, he was so impacted by it that he actually referred to himself not as John, by his name. He would often refer to himself of how he self-identified, the disciple that Jesus loved. In this short little book of 1 John, he uses the word love 43 times. So there's going to be a common theme you're going to see through this, I think. Now, in the beginning of the book, John's going through, he's talking about walking in the light, and then he goes on to ways to discern if things are from God or not. But what we're going to do now is we're going to focus on 1 John 4, verses 7 to 12. And I think the big thing to take away is that despite anything else, the most important thing is to love well. Let's, let's jump in. Verses four, um, I'm sorry, verses seven and eight, one four. Open up. Toward the back of the Bible. It says, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And the, the big thought here that I want to suggest is that there's really a direct link drawn here between our knowledge of God and the love we show to others. So the question is, how am I doing at loving others? For me, a lot of times it sounds kind of harsh to, to link this practical love we show to others with our spiritual lives. Now, first I want to acknowledge that, that this loving others in this way, it's a supernatural thing. It's not something that just sort of naturally comes out. Also, we need to be really careful not to think that loving others earns us favor with God. You see, it's, it's a bit more like a car, okay? The exhaust doesn't drive the car, right? But if there's no exhaust coming out of the car, you really have to question whether the car's running. I'd suggest that loving others is very similar to that in the Christian life. That we're saved from our infidelities through faith or trust in Jesus. But the natural output of that is a very radical love, a very sacrificial love. And if we're not actually actively involved in loving others around us, look, just reality-wise, you probably need to question the spirituality. Because we were designed to allow God's love to flow through us. Anybody who claims to be doing the will of God and reflects God's activity in the world should be known by their love, right? If we fail to love others, then I would suggest that we're not actually in touch with the source of our love. We're not imitating the model that's given to us. And frankly, we're disobeying the command of Jesus. As a result, our claim to know God, it just rings a little bit hollow. Because God is love. That's how he defines himself. Now, I want to be careful here uh, as we look at the definition of love because we're going to touch on some sensitive cultural sin issues. And so you guys need to be gentle with me. I'm going to try and be gentle as well. But I think it's important to talk about some of these things. And the things I'm going to share, not everyone... This is, I'm not talking about everyone, okay? But there are a couple prevalent patterns in our society, I'll say. You see, 
a lot of times in Australian culture, we define love by the absence of hate. Okay? So basically, we, lo we say we love everyone unless we have sort of an open conflict with them. Right? Now, there's some different things. When we don't agree with somebody or we feel like others might demand too much of us, we have this habit of blanking people. Or another way is saying that sort of functionally we ignore people's existence. And it's actually quite cruel and dehumanizing in a lot of ways. But it comes very natural to our culture. And I would suggest the mistake we make in our culture is in our definition of love. You see, love is not the opposite of hate. I would suggest. I would suggest the opposite of love is apathy. You see, if you're really angry with somebody, you're still engaging with that person. Look, I'm not saying it's ideal. Oftentimes it's probably not handled in a healthy way. But you're still invested in that relationship when you're angry with somebody. You look at married couples. If you're looking at a married couple and they're still fighting, that means they still care about the relationship. There's hope. It's when a married couple stops fighting, there's sort of this calm. That signals the real death of the relationship. Because it means that people have given up and they're no longer invested in the relationship. When we give up, we walk away, that's when real disconnection happens. And so I would suggest that apathy, not hate, is the real opposite of love. Let me illustrate this. There's a mom who went to a church play group uh, here in Melbourne. It wasn't here, so we're okay. I'm not going to give names, but yep. Um, she tried to initiate a whole bunch of conversations in this play group, but everybody sort of had their friendship circles. And nobody's treated her badly, overtly, but nobody included her at all. And she just, despite all her attempts to initiate conversation, she just wasn't part of the friendship circles. And so she walked out afterwards, and her quote was, I wish I were a cow, because then at least people would acknowledge my existence in the room. Now, none of this was expressed to anybody at the playgroup. But I'll tell you what, she never returned. And frankly, she wasn't open to returning to that church. My suggestion is that she wasn't hated at all, but she wasn't loved despite the best intentions of this church. You see, the problem is we don't get to define if we're loving people or not. We don't get to say that about ourselves. That's defined by others, and it's defined over time. You know, in our neighborhood, Christians have this reputation of people that love well. Uh, a lot of people think we have strange beliefs. <laughs> And that's all right. Um, but when there's a problem, people know who to turn to. Why? It's because there's been consistent, practical, and intentional acts of love over time. And they know who they can depend on. You see, we don't get to define are we a loving people or not. That's defined by the culture around us. Now, at Eastley, to bring this home, I actually think we do really well at this. I think this is a real strength that we have. We have a real community of loving people. But I want to push us a little bit because I think inside this room, we actually connect really well and we have a very tight, loving community. The problem is, if we walked outside of these walls, I'm not sure how many people would actually say, Eastley, they're a super loving community that cares about me. And so I want to push us a little bit. Um, and, and it may be a little uncomfortable, and that's okay. So, let's continue on. It says, in verses 9 and 10, 
of 1 John 4. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And what I want to suggest, the big idea here, is that God's definition of love is far beyond what we feel comfortable with. God's definition of love is far beyond what we feel comfortable with. And what I want to do is I think God gives us a model here of really how to love well. And there's a few observations that, that I want us to make. First one is that love is initiating. It's not passive. You see, in this verse, we read that, that God stepped out of a perfect relationship in a perfect place to a sin-soaked world. God chose action over inaction. Love demands that we don't just passively sit by waiting, but rather that we take the initiative for the betterment of others. I'll put all these up there. That way you can see them all. Second observation. Love is not based on the worthiness of the receiver. It's not natural. Okay? This is a big one. This is one that we are really working on trying to hammer home with our kids at home. And I think we're all in process on this one a little bit. But one of the hardest elements, I think, of love is to forgive someone and not punish them when you're angry with them. The problem is, Scripture goes way beyond that. Right? In 1 Peter 3, 9, we're told not just to forgive people, not just to refrain from punishment, but to actually actively bless people that hurt us. You know, it's easy to love those who love us. We're good at that. But for those who I perceive are against me, or people that are actually against me, that, that goes against the grain. That takes a whole new thought process. But I'll suggest it also makes true love stand out. You know, one of the big practices I've tried to start incorporating into my life is that whenever I'm angry, I very intentionally go out of my way and do something nice for the person I'm angry with. So if you get cookies for me or biscuits for me, watch out. <laughs> Now, it's, it's so hard, but it's a real game changer in my perspective because all of a sudden it changes my whole perspective around. And I like to think that it also speaks loudly to the person that I'm blessing. Hopefully my message, and this is what I want to communicate, but it's an important message that so often gets lost when all the emotions start welling up is that, you know, I actually value you as a person more than I value our disagreement. And that's a powerful statement. I value you more, you more as a person than our disagreement. The third ob observation there is that love often involves death. Now, this isn't always true, but often there's a sense of dying in love. It's letting go of our desires for revenge. You know, often I find myself loving those who are easy to love or that can return my love. But that's not the sacrificial love that Jesus is talking about. You see, when we give sacrificially and we relinquish the right to be right, we, we, sacri we self-sacrifice, we sacrifice time, energy, our desires, what we thought we'd do sometimes, our expectations. You know, it'd be nice and neat if we could schedule loving others into our, into our diary and that that would all work out well. But that so rarely happens. It, it's loving others requires me to be sacrificial in the moment. And when we give sacrificially, not expecting anything in return, God so often shows up in just absolutely amazing ways that we would never imagine you know, I think 
Giving like that is a really life-changing practice for both the giver and the receiver. It's a powerful way to reach out to some of our unchurched friends. God changes hardened hearts and brings real joy as people start to experience who God is through us. The big thing is that we need to value other people first. We need to think through, not how can I love them in a way that I would appreciate, but how can I love them in a way that they would appreciate? And when we do, God shows up, and I would suggest that that's real love. Reminds me of a story of a woman who who telephoned her friend and asked how she was feeling. (sighs) Terrible, came the reply. I've got a headache, my back and feet are killing me. The house is a mess, and the kids are just, oh, they're driving me crazy. Sympathetically, the caller said, you know, listen, go lie down. I'll come right over and cook you dinner. I'll cook some lunch for you. We'll clean up the house. Um, I'll take care of the kids while you get some rest. By the way, how's Sam going? Confused, the complaining wife said, Sam? Who's Sam? Sam? Oh my, exclaimed the first woman. I think I've dialed the wrong number. There was a long, awkward pause at that moment. Before the troubled mother hopefully asked, So, are you still planning on coming over? (laughs) You know, the thing that speaks loudest is love. Freely given when somebody else is in need. Not based on what the giver feels like in the moment, but a sacrifice of love. And God can use that to radically change lives. Fourth observation is that love breathes life into the receiver. It's redeeming. At our house, we talk a lot about being a life giver or a life taker. Okay, So we'll ask if an action breathes life into people, or actually sucks life, steals life away from others. Think about what are the things that we most desire from others? What are those things that our hearts long for? It's someone who's safe and loves us unconditionally, right? It's it's someone who knows that we're messed up. They accept us for who we are, but they're still committed to working with us as we work through our junk together as a community, right? Someone who can punish us, but instead chooses to forgive us and love us. Someone who recognizes when when we have needs and and when we need to be loved, and then they know how to do it well. We want people who are life givers, not life takers. And so the big thing is thinking through, okay, we want that. How can we be that to the lives of others? How can God use us in the lives of others to give life to them instead of taking life away from them? The last part of our thing, verses 11 and 12 says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, We also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made complete in us. I'd suggest that our proper heartfelt response to salvation, to God's forgiveness of our lives, ought to be a reflection of God's love to others. If we're in touch with the source of love, if we receive this healing love of God in our lives, we're not being asked to do something alien to our experience or beyond our ability to learn and do. But there is an element of learning and growing, and that's okay. You see, God is known and, and experienced as we love each other. His love is made complete by us loving others. Think about that for a minute. The word complete actually means 
that it achieves its full purpose. So to reword that, we love one another. God lives in us, and his love achieves its full purpose in us. As Christians, does that mean that we're meant to go around to make everybody feel warm and fuzzy? Maybe. Maybe a little bit more than we do. I think there's a calling on us to live lives of specific, personal, and supernatural love. That we imitate God in loving others, and we help others take a step closer to Jesus. You know, that's our mission on earth, right? It's the same as Jesus' mission. To make disciples who make disciples, right? And so we need to help our help people wrestle with the basic truths of the gospel. We need to help people, we need to help our friends learn how to come to faith. We need to teach others about how God wants them to grow. We need to help them as they start to become an apprentice disciple maker. And then we need to send them out well as a commissioned disciple maker to repeat that process in others. This is what the Great Commission is all about. But it always needs to be paired with the great commandment. And that is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love others as ourselves. And this selfless, this job of the great commandment and the great commission are wed together. That they they require each other. That this selfless love is a vehicle by which we are to labor in the great commission. And to spread the gospel. All right, so now, exciting part that you guys have all been waiting for. Practical next steps. We have lots of sermons. They're great. They're awesome. One of the issues in our culture is that we hear a lot of great things. We say, oh, that was fantastic. I'm really challenged by that. And then we walk away and it never changes us. And so what I want to do is today, I want you to choose. I'm going to have two lists. And I'm going to have you choose one thing from each list that I want you to actually practically apply in the next week. In a, and we're going to talk about that, okay? So I'm going, to, I'm going to push you a little bit and make you feel uncomfortable. Is that all right? Yeah? All right. So, first thing is thinking through. God wants to work in your life, right? Our job is to be tenderhearted towards him and open our lives up to him. We need to soak in his word regularly. This is particularly hard, I think, amidst the busy schedule. But we need to maintain open lines of communication with God and be able to listen to the Holy Spirit speaking into our lives, right? So, first thing. Are we, are we drinking deeply from the source? Are we spending time reading the Bible? Are we spending time in prayer? Are we spending time worshiping God? If you are, that's awesome. That's wonderful. If not, maybe one of your things in this section might be saying, hey, you know what? This week, I want to spend a couple, I'm going to spend, you know, even if it's 15 minutes a day, that I'm going to spend You know, maybe one day it's reading the Bible some. Maybe one day it's praying. Maybe it's one day it's listening to worship music and singing along. Great. And you just repeat that process. Whatever it is, I want us to think through, how how are we experiencing God's love in our lives? Are we experiencing that? If not, then we don't really have much to give others, right? All right. Second thing is... Considering our brothers and sisters here at Eastleigh, and actually probably more throughout the world, how many of us are perfect? Good, good. None of us. Okay. Now, I'm going to make an assumption that if people have close relationships, they're going to they're gonna sin. If you hang around me, it's not an if I sin. It's, it's more of a when I sin. You see... The whole idea of the gospel is that we're all in process together. And the only way we win or succeed is if we all succeed together. We're a team. 
We're a community. We're a people. And when one part hurts, all of us hurt. Now, sometimes when I'm hurt, I want to lash out as, as a defense mechanism. But how we deal with frustrations as a community is going to go a long way in determining the quality of our relationships. Our duty is to deal with conflict well and to love our brothers and sisters well. It doesn't matter if that love is returned or not. Love is not based on them. We have an obligation to a higher source. And so one of the big encouragements is that no matter what happens or how we may be treated unfairly, we need to choose to love. And so the second and third option here, one is deal with conflict you have with others well. If you have conflict with somebody, if there's some things where you're like, oh, I'm just not even sure, flick them a text, go have a chat, go for a cuppa. Maybe your job this week is to say, I'm going to go out and I'm going to help resolve some of this conflict. Maybe you don't resolve it all. That's okay. But you make progress. You begin the conversation. The other possibility is that you can love your brothers and sisters in Jesus well. So thinking about how do we form real deep community. Again, maybe it's just going connecting and hearing somebody's life story. Maybe it's, you know, there's a hundred different options of what you could do, but, but actually to connect with somebody well and in, a, in depth. All right, so you get one from that list. Has, has the spirit sort of, maybe one that you're like, mm, I'm sort of leaning toward that? Couple people? Okay, good. All right, here's, here's, the next, here's the next step. And this one is reflecting on our communities at large. We are on the enemy's ground, and he doesn't like it. His strategy is to steal, kill, and destroy our love with the, fathers and with, with the Father and with others. The enemy is going to attack our love relationship with God, and he's going to sabotage church relationships. You know why? Because he wants to stop us loving those around us with a radical love. He'll make us busy. He'll do whatever he can to stop us loving the community with a radical, deep love. And so, think about this. How can we show God's love by listening to the story of, of our neighbors, of our friends, of our community? Can we take an interest in them by asking questions? Can we show God's love through generosity, like cooking up a meal or buying some groceries for a neighbor? Can we show God's love by encouraging someone who maybe we're even not as connected with? Maybe we go out for a cup or maybe it's somebody at work that we write a note and say, a personalized note and say, hey, you know what? I really appreciate the way you do this. Um, can we show God's love through acts of kindness? Maybe it's mowing lawn, helping out in some way with a project uh, baking some biscuits. You know, we have we have um, a lady in our neighborhood, and she's uh, she's she said, you know what? I want to teach your daughter how to sew. Oh, Karis loves it. It's she has the time of her life. But that breathes such life into her and to us as parents. It's so significant. But how can you play a role in people around you? Lastly, how can we show God's love? by praying for people. You know, it's, it's mentioning that, you know, hey, is it okay if I pray for you? That's huge. Maybe, if you're a little bit bolder, you say, hey, can I pray for you right now? Look, see what God does. The big idea is that you can show God's love to everyone. And it takes time to specifically focus on others. But coming around and walking through life with people is just so important. And it's commanded to us by Scripture. And so what I want to do is close with a quick story of William Shackleton, who was a famous Arctic explorer, who was asked to recount his most difficult experience. He said one night in an emergency hut, his men and he were trying to sleep. They just rationed out their last biscuits there's no other food. There's nothing left to eat. Every man appeared to be asleep. But all of a sudden, Shackleton sensed movement. 
And he turned around to see a man turning to look around at, at the other men in the hut. Obviously, this man thought everybody else was asleep, and so he very quietly stretched over the next man next to him. He took his biscuit bag, and he removed the biscuit from the bag. Now, Shackleton was dumbfounded. He thought, these are men that I thought I could trust my, with my life. Now he's stealing a man's last biscuit. Had the pressure made him in, turned him into a thief and a betrayer? Then he saw this man move again. This man removed the biscuit from his bag. And he put both biscuits in the other man's bag and quietly returned the bag to his sleeping friend's side. Shackleton said, I dare not tell you that man's name. I felt that act was a secret between himself and God. And it was just one biscuit. But how powerful. May we be like that man who gave his last biscuit to someone in need. Because no one has ever said, I left the church because they loved me too much. Now, behind me, I've, I've, I've got this up. Pick one thing from the left column, one thing from the right column. If you need to write it down, if you need to put it in your phone, I'll give you a moment right now to do that. And as the worship team comes up, I want you to think about how can we actually put some of these things into practice? How can we make a difference in the lives of those around us?